Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Julie Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. News stories are posted every month on the second Sunday at 2.30 p.m. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube page or following our Facebook. As a reminder, some stories contain adult language and content. It is recommended you review stories before allowing younger audiences to listen. This is the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library word of mouth presentation for July of 2024. My name is Robert Tobias. As usual, this is an adult story time meant for adults, so viewer discretion is advised. However, this month we'll have something a little special. Since the 4th of July falls on this month, I will be reading an excerpt from Benjamin Franklin's unfinished autobiography. This means this text is historic and has actually been used in classrooms for over a hundred years. While viewer discretion is still advised, as always, due to parental oversight, this might sway your opinion on such to make it a little easier and more palatable. With that being said, Dear son, I have ever had pleasure in obtaining any little antecedent of my ancestry. You may remember the inquiries I made among the remains of my relations when you were with me in England and the journey I undertook for that purpose. Imagine it may be equally agreeable to you to know the circumstances of my life, many of which you are yet unacquainted with, and expecting the enjoyment of a week's uninterrupted leisure in my present country retirement. I sit down to write them to you to which I have, besides, some other small matters to attend. Having emerged from the poverty and obscurity of the world in which I was born and bred, to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity and considering the means I have made use of, which is a blessing of God so well succeeded, my posterity may like it to know, as they may find some of them suitable to their own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. That felicity, when I reflect upon it, has induced me sometimes to say that, were it offered to my choice, I should have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in a second edition to correct some minor faults in the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accents and events of it for other more favorable. But though this were denied, I should still accept the offer. Since such a repetition is not to be expected, Nespeth thing most like living one's life again, seems to be recollecting that life, and to make that recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. Hereby, too, I shall indulge the inclinations so natural in old men. To be talking of themselves and their own past actions, I shall indulge it without being some tiresome like others, who, though respect to age, might conceive themselves obliged to give me a hearing, since this may be read or not, as perhaps anyone pleases. And lastly, I may as well confess it, since my denial of it will be believed by nobody, perhaps I shall have a good deal to gratify my own vanity. Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words Without vanity, I may say, etc., but some vain thing immediately following. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever share they have themselves, but I give it fair quarter. Wherever I meet with it, being persuaded that it is often productive of good to the professor and to others that are within the sphere of action, and therefore, in many cases, it would not be an altogether absurd if a man were to think 
that he should thank God for his vanity among other comforts in life. And now I speak of thanking God. I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe the mentioned happiness of my life to his kind providence, which led me to the means I used and gave them success. My belief of this induced me to hope, though I must not presume, that the same goodness will still be exercised toward me in continuing that happiness or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse, which I may experience as others have done, the complexion of my future fortune being known to him only in whose power it is to bless us even in our afflictions. The notes one of my uncles, who had the same kind of curiosity in collecting family antecedents, once put in my hands, furnished me with several particular peculiarities regarding our ancestors. From these notes, I have learned that the family had lived in the same village, Ecton, in North Northamptonshire for 300 years, and how much longer he knew not, perhaps from the time when the name Franklin, that before was the name of an order of people, was assumed to be the surname when others took surnames all over the kingdom, on a freehold of about 30 acres, aided by the Smith's business, which had continued in the family till his time, the eldest son being always bred to that business, a custom which he and my father followed to as to their eldest sons. When I searched for registers in Ecton, I found an account of their births, marriages, burials, from the year 1555 only, there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding. I perceived that I was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back. My grandfather Thomas, who was born in 1598, lived at Ecton till he grew too old to follow business any longer, when he went to live with his son John, a dyer in Branbury in Oxfordshire, with whom my father served an apprenticeship. There my grandfather died and lies buried. We saw his gravestone in 1758. His eldest son Thomas lived in the house at Ecton and lived in it with the land left to his only child, a daughter who, with her husband, one Fisher of Wellingborough, sold it to Mr. Instead, now lord of the manor there. My grandfather had four sons that grew up, Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. I'll give you what account I can of them at this distance from my papers, and if <laughs> these are not lost in my absence, you will find them among them many more peculiarities. Thomas was bred a smith under his father, but being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman of that parish, he qualified himself for the business of Scrivener and became a considerable man in the county, was the chief mover of all public-spirited undertakings for the county or town of, Nor of Northampton and his village, which many instances related to him, and much taken notice of and patronized by the Lord Halifax. He died in 1702, January 6th, just four years to the day before I was born. The account received of his life and character from some people in Acton, I remember, struck you as something extraordinary from its similarity to what you knew of mine. He died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed a transmigration. John was bred a dyer, I believe of woolens. Benjamin was bred a silk dyer, serving in an apprenticeship at London. He was an ingenious man, I remember him well. For when I was a boy, he came over to my father in Boston and lived in the house with us for some years. He lived to a great age. His grandson, Samuel Franklin, now lives in Boston. He left behind two quattro volumes of his own poetry, consisting of little occasional pieces addressed to his friends and relationships, of which this, the following sent to me as a specimen. He formed a shorthand of his own, which he taught me, but never practicing it, I've forgotten it. I was named after this uncle, there being a particular affection between him and my father, 
He was very pious, a great attender of sermons of the best preachers, which he took down his shorthand, and he had with him many volumes of them. He was also much of a politician, too much, perhaps, for a station. There fell lately into my hands in London a collection he had made of all the principal pamphlets relating to public affairs from 1641 to 1717. Many of the volumes are wanting, as appears by the numbers, but there still remains eight volumes in folio, about 24 in quarto and in octavo. A dealer in old books might me well meet with them, and knowing by something of buying him, a dealer in old books met with them, and knowing me by sometimes buying of him, he bought them from me. It seems my uncle must have left them here when he went to America, when he was about fifty years since. There are many of his notes in the margins. The obscure family of ours was early in the Reformation and continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary, when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of zeal against the Pope. They had got an English Bible, and to conceal and secure it, it was fastened open with tapes under and within the cover of a joint stool. When they, when my great-great-grandfather read it to his family, he turned up the joint stool upon his knees, turning over the leaves under the tapes. One of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparitor coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court, and in that case, the stool was turned down again upon its feet, where the Bible remained concealed under it. This ascient I had found from my uncle Benjamin. The family continued all of the Church of England till about the end of Charles II's reign, which some of the ministers they had found outed for nonconformity, holding conventicles in North Hampshire. Benjamin and Josiah adhered to them, and so they continued their lives. The rest of the family remained with the Episcopal Church. Josiah, my father, married young and cared for his wife and three children into New England about 1682. The conventicles had been forbidden by law and frequently distributed, including some considerable men of his acquaintance to remove of that country. And he was prevailed to, to accompany them therein, where they expected to enjoy their mode of religion with freedom. By the same wife he had four more born there, and by a second wife ten more, seventeen in all, of which I remember thirteen sitting at one table at a time, who all grew up to be men and women, and married, I was the youngest son and the youngest child but two, and was born in Boston, New England. My mother, the second wife of Abia Fulger, daughter of Peter Fulger, one of the first settlers in New England, of whom honorable mention is made by Cotton Mather in his Church History of the Country, entitled Mangelina Christi Americana, as a good, godly, learned Englishman, if I remember his words correctly. I have heard that he wrote sundry small occasional pieces only one of them was printed, which I saw now many years since. It was written in 1675 in a homespun verse at that time, and people addressed to those then concerned in the government there. It was in favor of liberty and conscience on behalf of the Baptists, the Quakers, and other secretaries that had been under the presumption ascribing the Indian Wars and other distresses that had befallen the country. To that prescription, as so many judgments of God to punish so heinous an offense, and exhorting a repeal of those uncharitable laws. The whole appeared to me as a written with a good deal of decent plainness and many freedoms. The six concluding lines remember, though I have forgotten the first of the stanzas, but the purport of them was that his censure preceded the good will, and therefore he wanted to be known by the author. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year. 
though in that time I had gradually risen from the middle of the class of that year to being the head of it, and farther was removed into the next class above it, or to go with that into the third and the end of the year. But my father, in the meantime, from a view of the expense of college education, which having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living so many educated were afterwards able to maintain, reasons that he gave his friends in my hearing, alert to his first intention, he took me from grammar school and sent me to school for writing and arithmetic. Keeping by then famous men, Mr. George Brownwell, very successful in the profession, generally, and that by mild encouraging methods. Under him I acquired a fair pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic and made no progress in it. At ten years old I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of a tallow chandler and soap boiler, a business he was not bred to, but he had assumed on his arrival in New England, and finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being of little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for the candles, filling the dipping bowls and mounds for the candles, attending the shop, going on errands, etc. I disliked the trade, and had a strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it. However, living near the water, I was so much in and about it, learning early to swim well and to manage boats, and when in a boat or canoe of other boys, I was commonly allowed to govern in case of any difficulty, and upon occasion I was generally a leader among the boys, and sometimes led them to scraps, of which I mention one instance it shows of early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. There was a self march that bounded parts of the mill pond on the edge at the high water. We used to stand to fish for minnows. By much trampling, we made it a mere quagmire. My personnel was to build a wharf there and fit for us to stand upon, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the march, and which were very well suited for our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening, when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working with them diligently like so many, sometimes two or three of stone, we brought them all the way and built our little wharf. The next morning the workmen were surprised at the missing stones, which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made about the removers, and we were discovered and complained of, several of us corrected by our fathers, and though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. I think you may like to know something of his person and character. He was an excellent constitution of body and was of middle stature, but well set and very strong. He was ingenious, could draw prettily, was skilled in a little music, and he had a clear, pleasant voice, so that when he played song tunes on his violin and sung withal, as he sometimes did in the evening after the business of the day was over, it was extremely agreeable to hear. He had a mechanical genius, too, on occasion, was very handy in the use of tra other tradesmen's tools, but his great excellence lay in a sound understanding and solid judgment of prudential matters, both private and public affairs. In later, indeed, he was never employed. The numerous families he had educated, and the strangeness of the circumstances keeping him close to the trade, but I remember, well, he being frequently upon by leading people, consulted him for his opinion after affairs of the town or the church belonged to him, and showed a good deal of respect for his judgment and advice. He was also much consulted by private persons about their affairs when any difficulties occurred, and was frequently chosen as an arbitrator between contending parties. At his table he liked to have, as often he could, some sensible friend or neighbor with which to converse. At his table he liked to have, as often as he could, some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with, and always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic of discourse, which tend to improve the minds of his children. This means he turned our attention to what was good, just, and prudent in the conduct of life. And little or no notice was ever taken of what related to the victuals of the table, whether it 
is well dressed or ill, in or out of season, good or bad flavor, preferable or inferior to this or that or thing of the kind, so that I was brought up in such a perfect attention of those matters as to be quite indifferent to what food was set before me, and so observant of it, that to this day I am asked I can scarce tell a few hours of dinner what I dined upon. This has been a convenience to me in travelling, where my companions may have sometimes been very unhappy for want of suitable gratification of their delicate sensibilities, because being better instructed, taste, and in appetites as well. My mother had likewise an excellent constitution. As she suckled all her ten children, I never knew either my father or mother to have sickness of any kind, but for that from which they died, he was eighty-nine, she eighty-five years of age. They lie buried together in Boston, where I some years since placed a marble over their grave, with the inscription Josiah Franklin and Abiah, his wife, lie here interred. They live lovingly together in Woodlock fifty-five years. Without an estate or any grateful employment, by constant labor of industry, with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably, and brought up thirteen children and seven grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged and diligent in thy calling, and distrust not providence. He was a pious and prudent man, she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in feeling regard to memory, places this so. J. F., born 1655, died 1744. A. F., born 1667, died 1752-85. <laughs> By my rambling aggression, I perceive myself that I have grown old. I used to write more methodically, but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. "'Tis perhaps only negligence. But "'To return, I continued thus employed in my father's business for two years, "'that is, till I was twelve years old, and my brother John, "'who was bred to do that business, having left my father, "'married and set up for himself at Rhode Island. "'There was an appear apprentice that I was destined to apply his place "'and become a tallow chandler. "'Trade continuing, my father under apprehension that if I did not find one, one for me more agreeable, I should break away and go to sea, as his son Josiah had done, to his great vexation. He therefore sometimes took me for a walk with him to see joiners, bricklayers, turners, brazers, etc., all the work that my observed inclinations and endeavor to fix on some trade or other on land. It has ever since been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools, and it has always been useful to me having learned so much of it to be able to do little jobs for myself around my own house when a workman could not be really got, and to construct little machines for my experiments, while the intentions of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind, at least. My father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade, and Uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was bred to that business in London, being about to establish himself in Boston, I was sent to be with him, some time on the liking. But his expectations of a fee with me displeasing my father, I was taken home again. Chapter 2 begins beginning life as a printer. From a child, I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came to my hands was ever laid out into books. Pleased with Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was on John Bunyan's work in separate little volumes. Afterwards, I sold them to enable me to buy Arbert's historical collections. Uh, they were small chapman's books, and cheap, forty or fifty in all. My father's little library consisted chiefly of books in polemics, divinity, most of which I read, and I have often regarded them since the time when one had such a thirst for knowledge. More proper books have not fallen my way, since now I resolve I should not be a clergyman. Plutarch's Lives... There was, in the book I read abundantly, I still think that time spent to great advantage, though. There was also a book of Defoe's called Essays on Projects, and another of Dr. Mather's Essays on Doing Good, which perhaps gave me a turn of thinking that had influenced some principal future event in my life. 
This bookish inclination at length determined my father to make me a printer, though he had already one son, James, of that profession. In 1717, my brother James returned from England with a press and letters set up for his business in Boston. I liked it much better than any of that of my father, but still had a hankering for the sea. The effect of such an inclination, my father was impatient to have me be bound to my brother. I stood out some time, but was at last persuaded and signed the indentures, which I was yet but twelve years old. I was to serve as an apprentice till I was twenty-one years of age. Only I was allowed to be a journeyman's wage during that last year. In a little time, I made great proficiency in the business and become a useful hand to my brother. I now had access to better books. An acquaintance with the apprenticeships of booksellers enabled me sometimes to borrow a small one, and which I can carefully return soon and clean. Often I sat up in my room, reading the greatest part of the night, when the book was borrowed in the evening and to be returned in the early morning, lest I should be missed or wanted. For some ingenious time, the tradesman, Mr. Matthew Adams, who had a pretty collection of books, and who would frequent our printing house, took notice of me and invited me to his library very kindly and let me such books that I could choose to read. I now took a fancy to poetry and made some little pieces my brother, thinking it might turn to account, encouraged me and put me on composing occasional ballads. One was called The Lighthouse Tragedy and contained an account of the drowning of Captain Worth Lake with his two daughters, the other sailor's song, and a talking of teach or blackbeard a pirate. They were wretched stuff, in the Grub Street ballad style, and they were printed, and he had sent them out all over town. The first sold wonderly by event of being recent, having made great noise. This flattered my vanity, and my father discouraged me from ridiculing my performances and telling me verse makers were generally beggars. So I escaped being a poet, most probably a very bad one. But as prose writing has been of great use to me in the course of my life, and was principal means of my advancement, I shall tell you how, in such a situation, such a situation, I had acquired what little ability I had in that way. There was another bookish lad in town, John Collins by name, with whom I was intimately acquainted. We sometimes disputed, very fond we were of argument, and very desirous of confronting the other, with disputations turned, by the way, is apt to become a very bad habit of making people often extremely disagreeable in company by the contradiction that is necessary to bring into practice, and thence, besides sourcing and spoiling the conversation, is productive of disgust and perhaps enmities where you have may any occasions have many options for friendship. I had caught it by reading my father's books of dispute about religion. Persons of good sense, since I have observed, seldom fall into it, except lawyers, university men, and men of all sorts that have been bred in Edinburgh. A question was once, something or other, stated between Collins and me, of the propriety of educating females in learning, under ability to study, he was of the opinion that it was improper and that they were naturally unequal to it. I took the contrary side, perhaps a little for dispute's sake. He was naturally more eloquent and had read plenty of works, and sometimes I thought bore me down with his fluency and the strength of his reasons. As we parted without settling the point and were not to see another for some time, I sat down and put my arguments in writing, which I copied fair and set sent to him. He answered, and I replied. Three or four letters aside had passed when my father happened to find my papers and reading them. Without entering into the discussion, he took occasion to talk to me about the manner of my writing, observed that, though I had advantage of my antagonist in correct spelling and pointing, which I owe to being working in the print house, I fell short in the elegance of expression and methods which he had, of which convinced me several instances. I saw the justice of his remarks and therefore grew more attentive to my manners in writing and then determined to endeavor improvement. About this time, I had met a very odd volume 
of the specter. It was the third. I had never before seen any of them. I bought it and read it over and over, and was much delighted with it. I thought the writing excellent, and wished, if possible, to imitate style. With this view, I took some papers and, making short hints of the sentiment in each sentence, laid them by a few days, and then, without looking at the book, tried to complete the papers again by expressing each hint and sentiment at length and at full, and fully expressed before in suitable words that should come in hand. I then compared my specter to the original and discovered some of my faults and corrected them. But I found I wanted a stock of words of, or a readiness in recollecting them and using them, which I thought I should have acquired before the time I had gone to make the verse, since the continual occasion for words of the same import but different length to suit the measure or different sounds for the rhyme would have laid me under constant necessity of searching for such a variety, and it often turned me to fix that variety in my mind and to make master of it. Therefore I took some of the tales and turned them into verses after a time, which I pretty well forgotten the prose, turned them back again. I also sometimes juggled my collection of hints to confusion, and after some weeks endeavored to reduce them into their best order before I began to form the full sentences and complete works on paper. That was the teach me method of arrangement of my thoughts. By comparing my works afterwards to the original, I discovered many faults and amended them. But I sometimes had the pleasure of fancying that, in certain particularities of small importance, I had been lucky enough to improve the method of my language, and encouraged me to think I might possibly be in time to make a tolerable English writer, of which I was extremely ambitious. My time for these ex exercises and reading was at night, after work or before it began in the morning, or on Sundays when I contrived to be in the printing house alone, evading as much as I could the common attendance of public worship which my father used to exact upon me when I was under his care, and which indeed I still thought a duty, though could not, as it seemed to me, afford time to practice it. When about sixteen years of age, I happened to meet a book, one written by Tyron, recommending a vegetable diet. I determined to go for it. My brother, being yet unmarried, did not keep house, but boarded himself and his apprentices in another family. My refusal to eat flesh occasioned an inconveniency, and I was frequently chided for my singularity. I made up myself acquainted with Tyron's manner of preparing some of his dishes, such as boiling potatoes or rice, baking a hasty pudding, and a few others that had proposed my brother that he would give me weekly half the money I, he paid for my board. I would board myself for those times. He instantly agreed to it and presented me. He found that I could save half of what he paid me. This was an additional fund for buying books, of course. But I had another advantage in it. My brother and the rest, going from the printing house to their meals, I remained there alone, dispatching presently my light repast which often was no more than a biscuit or a slice of bread and a handful of raisins or a tart from pastry cook, cook and a glass of water, had the rest of the time returned to study, which I had made great progress from that great clearness of head and quicker apprehension which usually attend temperance in eating and drinking. And now it was that, being on some occasional made ashamed of my ignorance at figures, which I had twice failed in learning school, I took to Cocker's book of arithmetic, and went to the whole by myself with great ease. I also read Seller and Shermie's books on navigation, and became acquainted with the little geometry they contained, but never proceeded far into the science. And I read about this time Locke on Human Understanding and the Art of Thinking by Mesmer's du Port Royal. While I was intent on improving my language, I met with an English grammar, I think it was Greenwood's, at the end of which there were two little sketches of an art of rhetoric and logic, the later finishing with a specimen of a dispute in the Socratic method, and soon I procured Xenophon's memorable things of Socrates, wherein there were many instances of the same method. I was charmed with it, adopted it, dropped my abrupt contradictions and positive argumentations, and put on the humble inquirer and doubter. And being then, from reading Shaftesbury and Collins, became a real doubter of many points of religious doctrine. 
I found this method safest for myself and very embarrassing to those whom against I used it. Therefore, I took delight in practicing it, practiced it continually, and grew ever very artful and ex an expert at drawing people, even of superior knowledge, into con concessions, the consequences of which they did not foresee, entangling them in difficulties out of which they could not extradite themselves, and so obtain victories that neither myself nor the cause always deserved. I continued this method for some years, gradually left it, retaining only to have expressed myself in terms of modest diffidence, never using when I had advanced anything that may have possibly been disputed, the word certainly or undoubtedly or any other that could have given me an air of positiveness to an opinion, but rather say I conceive or apprehend that a thing or so-so to be appears to be, or I should think so, for such and such reason, or I imagine it to be so, or if I am not mistaken. This habit, I believe, has been of great advantage to me when I have the occasion to inculate my opinions and persuade men in the measures that have been, from time to time, engaged in promoting, and that as chief ends of the conversation are to inform, or to be informed, to please, or to, or to persuade. I wish well-meaning, sensible men would not fear their power doing good by a positive, assuming matter, the seldom fails to discuss tends to create opposition and defeat every one of those purposes for which speech was given to us, to wit, to giving or receiving information or pleasure. For if you would inform a positive and dogmatic matter in advancing your sentiments, you may provoke contradiction and prevent a candid attention. It wish to inform an improvement for the knowledge of others, and yet at the same time express yourself as firmly as fixed in your present options, modest, sensible men who do not love disputation will probably leave you undisturbed in your possession of your error. By such a matter, you can seldom hope to recommend yourself in pleasing your hearers or persuading them away from those concurrent desires. Pope says judiciously, men should be taught as if you taught them not, and things unknown proposed as things forgot farther recommend to us to speak though sure with seeming di diffidence and he might have coupled with this line that which he have coupled with another i think less properly for want of modesty is want of sense if you ask why less properly i repeat the lines immodest words admit no defense for what of modesty is want of sense now, is it want of sense where a man is so unfortunate as to have it, some apology for his want of modesty? It would not the line stand more justly thus. In modest words, admit but this defense, that want of modesty is want of sense. This, however, I should submit for better judgments. My brother had, in 1720 or 21, began to print a newspaper. It was the second that appeared in America. It was called the New England Current. The only one before it was the Boston Newsletter. I remember his being dissuaded by some of his friends from the undertaking and not likely to succeed, one newspaper being in their judgment enough for America at the time. At this time, 1771, there are not less than five and twenty. He went on, however, with the undertaking and had after having worked in composing the types and printing of the sheets, I was employed to carry the papers through the streets to customers. He had some ingenious men among his friends who amused themselves by writing little pieces for his paper, which granted it credit and made it in more demand. These gentlemen often visited us, hearing their conversations, their accounts, their approbation, their papers was received with. I was excited to try my hand among them, but still being a boy, and suspecting that my brother would object to printing anything of mine in the paper if he knew it would be mine, I contrived to, to disguise my hand and writing an anonymous paper. I put it in at night under the door at the printing house. It was found the next morning, communicated to his writing friends when they were called to serve you. They read it, commented on it in my hearing, and had the exquisite pleasure of finding with him their approbations, and that and there are different guesses as to the author, none of them named 
but men of some character among us of the learned and genius. I suppose now that it was rather lucky in my judges that, and that perhaps they had not read so really so good ones, I had esteemed them. Encouraged, however, by this, I wrote and conveyed in the same way to the press several more papers which were equally approved. I kept it secret till my small fund of sense for such performance was pretty well exhausted, and then I discovered it when I began to consider a little more my brother's acquaintances, and I began a matter and did not quite please him, as he thought, probably with reason, that it tended to make me a little too vain. Perhaps this might be one occasion, the, the differences that we began to have at the time. Though a brother, he considered himself as my master and me as his apprentice, and accordingly expected the same service from me as he would another. Well, I thought he demanded of me too much someone it was required of me, for whom a brother is expected more indulgence. Our disputes were often brought before our father, and I fancy I was either generally right or else a better pleader, because the judgment was generally in my favor. But my brother was passionate and often had beaten me, which I took extremely amiss, and, thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, which at length offered in a manner unexpected. One of the pieces of our newspaper on some political point, which I had now forgotten, gave offence to the assembly. He was taken up, censured, and imprisoned a month by the speaker's warrant, I suppose, because he would not discover his author. I, too, was taken up and examined before the council, but though I did not give them any satisfaction, they contented themselves with admonishing me, dismissing me, considering me, perhaps, as an apprentice, who was bound to keep his master's secrets. During my brother's confinement, I, which I resented a good deal, I might note, notwithstanding our private differences, I had the management of the paper, and I had made a bold choice to give our rulers some rubs in it, which my brother took very kindly, while others began to consider me in an unfavorable light as a young genius that had turned to libeling and satire. My brother's discharge was a compliment need with an order of the house, a very odd one, that James Franklin should no longer print the paper called the New England Current. There was a consultation held in our printing house among his friends, what he should do with his case. Some proposed they evaded by changing the name of the paper, but my brother, seeing conveniences in that, was finally concluded as to a better way, to let me printed for the future under the name Benjamin Franklin and to avoid censure of the assembly, but my fall on him for still printing it by his apprentice, the contrivance was that my old indenture should be returned to me with full discharge on back to it, to be shown on occasion, but to secure him the benefit of my service. I was to sign a new indenture, remainder of the term, which were to be kept private. A very flimsy scheme it was, however, it immediately executed, and the paper went accordingly under my name for several months. At length, a fresh dif difference arising between my brother and me, I took it upon myself to assert my freedom, presuming that he would not venture to produce the new indentures. It was not fair to me to take advantage, and this I therefore reckoned on the first errata of my life, but the unfairness of it weighed little on me, when under the impression of resentment from the blows of his passion too often urged me to bestow upon me Though he was otherwise and not an ill-natured man, perhaps I was too saucy with the provoking. When he found I would leave him, he took care to prevent my getting employment at any other printing house in the town, going round and speaking to every master, accordingly refused to give me work. Then I thought of going to New York. As the nearest place where the print, there was a printer, I was rather inclined to leave Boston and reflect that I had already made myself a little obnoxious to the governing party and from the arbitrary proceedings of the assembly in my brother's case, it was likely I might, if I had stayed, soon bring myself into scrapes, and farther than my indiscreet disputations about religion began to make me point with the honor of good people as an infidel or an atheist. I had determined on the point, but my father was now sliding with my brother. I was sensible that if I attempted to openly go about it, 
means would have prevented me. My friend Collins, therefore, undertook to manage a little for me. He agreed with the captain of a New York sloop for my passage, under the notion of being a young acquaintance of his. So I sold some of my books to raise a little money and was taken aboard privately. And as we had fair wind, in three days I found myself in New York, nearly 300 miles from home, a boy of but 17, without the least recommendation to or knowledge of any person in the place with very little money in my pocket. Chapter 3, Arrival in Philadelphia. My inclinations for the seed were by this time worn out, or I might now have gratified them, but having a trade and supposed myself a pretty good workman, I offered my services to the printers in the place of old William Bradford, who had been the first printer in Pennsylvania, but removed from thence upon a quarrel with George Keith. He could give me no employment, having little to do and help enough already, but he said, My son at Philadelphia has lately lost the principal hand, the quill arose by death. If you go thither, I believe you may employ you. Philadelphia was a hundred miles further. I set out, however, in a boat from for Amboy, leaving my chest and things to follow me round by sea. In crossing the bay, I, we met with a squall that tore our rotten sails to pieces, preventing us getting killed, and drove us upon Long Island. In our way, a drunken Dutchman, who was a passenger too, fell overboard, when he was sinking, I reached through the water, shook his pate, and drew him up, and he got up again. His ducking sobered him a little too, and he went to sleep, taking first his pocketbook, which he desired I would dry out. It proved to be my old favorite author, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in Dutch, finely printed on good paper with copper cuts, addressed better than I had ever seen it wear in its own language. I had since found that it has been translated into most other languages of Europe, and so as to be one of the most generally read books in any other, except perhaps the Bible. Honest John was the first person I had that I knew who had mixed narration and dialogue, a method of writing and very engaging readers, who in the most interesting parts finds himself as or brought into the company and presence of the discourse, Defoe in his Curso and Mole Flanders religious courtship, family instruction, other pieces, it imitated with success. And Richardson had done the same in Pomelia, etc. When we drew near the island, we found it at a place where we could not find a landing, therefore being a great surf on a sunny shore. So we dropped anchor, swung around towards the shore itself. Some people came down to the water's edge and hailed to us, as we did with them, but the wind was so high and the surf so loud we could not hear as to understand each other. There were canoes on the shore, and we made signs and shouted, and they should fetch us. They either did not understand or thought it impracticable, so that they went away, night coming on, had no remedy but to wait for the wind should abate. In the meantime, the boatmen, I concluded to sleep, if we could, and so crowd into the scuttle. But the Dutchman, who was still wet, and the spray bearing over the end of our boat, leaked through us so that we soon almost were as wet as he. In this manner we lay all night with very little rest, but the wind abating the next day made a shift to reach Amboy before night, having been thirty hours on the water without victuals or any drink, but a bottle of filthy rum, the water which we sailed on being salt. In the evening I found myself very feverish and went to bed, but having read somewhere that cold water drank plentiful was good for fever, Followed this prescription, sweat plentifully most of the night, my fever left me. In the morning, crossing the ferry, proceeded on journeying with my feet, having fifty miles to Burlington, which I should find boats that would carry me the rest of the way to Philadelphia. It rained very hard all day. I was thoroughly soaked, and by noon I had a good deal done and was tired. So I stopped at a poor inn, where I stayed the night, beginning now to wish I had never left home. I cut so miserable a figure, too, that I found my questions asked of me. I was suspected to be some runaway servant, and danger of being taken upon that suspicion. However, I proceeded the next day, and got in the evening in with eight or ten miles of Burlington, to keep one Dr. Brown. He entered into conversation with me, while I was, took some refreshment, and finding I had read a little, became very sociable and friendly. One acquaintance... Our acquaintance, 
Our acquaintance continued as long as he lived. He had been, I imagine, an itinerant doctor, for there was no town in England or country in Europe of which he could not give a very particular account. He had some letters and was very ingenious, but much of an unbeliever and wickedly undertook, some years after, to travesty the Bible in dogged verse, as Cotton had done Virgil. By this means he set many of the facts in a very ridiculous light, and might have hurt weak minds if his work had published it never was, though. At this house I lay that night, and the next morning reached Burlington, but had the mortification to find that the regular boats were gone a little before my coming, and not expect to go before Tuesday, this being Saturday. Wherefore, I turned an old woman in town, of whom I had brought gingerbread to eat on the water, and asked her advice. She invited me to lodge her house till the passage of, by water should offer itself, and being tired of my foot traveling, accepted the invitation. She, understanding I was a printer, would have me stay at that town, follow my business, being ignorant of the stock necessary to begin with. She was very hospitable, gave me a dinner of ox cheek with great goodwill, accepting only a pot of ale in return, and I thought myself fixed till Tuesday should come. However, walking in the evening by the river, a boat came by, which I found was going towards Philadelphia with several people in her. They took me in as there was no wind. We rode all the way. And about midnight, not having seen the city yet, some of the company were confident we must have passed it and would row no further. Others knew not where they were, so we put toward the shore, got into a creek, land near an old fence, where the rails of which were made of fire, the night being cold in October, and there was little remaining of the daylight. And there we remained till daylight. Then one of my company knew the place to be Cooper's Creek, a little above Pennsylvania. Philadelphia, which we saw as soon as we had gone off the creek, and arrived there about eight or nine o'clock on Sunday morning, and landed at the Market Street Wharf. I have been more particular in this description of my journey, and shall be so for the first entry into that city, that you may, in your mind, compare such unlikely beginnings with the figure since made there. I was in my working dress, my best clothes being to come round by sea. I was dirty for my journey, my pockets were stuffed out with shirts and stockings. I knew no soul nor where to look for lodging. I was fatigued from traveling, rowing, and want of rest. I was very hungry, and my whole stock of cash consisted of a Dutch dollar, about a shilling, and a copper. The later I gave to the people in the boat for my passage, who was first willing to refuse on account of my rowing, but I insist on their taking it. A man sometimes being more generous when he has little money, but little money when he has plenty, perhaps through fear of being thought to have but little. Then I walked up the street, gazing about till near the market house I met a boy with bread. I had made many a meal on bread, and inquiring where he got it, I went immediately to the baker's he directed me to. In Second Street I asked for a biscuit and tang, such as it we had in Boston, but they did not seem to have it, nor was it made in Philadelphia. I then asked for a three-penny loaf, and was told that he had none such loaves. So not considering knowing the difference of money, and a great deal cheaper or in the names of bread, I bade him give me three penny worth of any sort. He gave me, accordingly, three great puffy rolls. I was surprised at the quantity, but took it, and having no room in my pockets, walked off with a roll under each arm and eating the other. Thus I went up to Market Street as far as 4th Street, passing by the door of Mr. Reed, my future wife's father, when she, standing at the door, saw me and thought I made, and certainly did, a most awkward and ridiculous appearance. Then I turned and went down Chestnut Street and part of Walnut Street, eating my roll all the way, and coming round, found myself again at Market Street's wharf, near the boat I came in, to which I went for a draught the river water, and, being filled with one of my rolls, gave the other two uh, to a woman and a child that came down the river but with us, and were wanting to go further. Thus refreshed, I walked up again to the street, by which this time had many clean-dressed people in it, who were all walking the same way. 
I joined them and thereby was led to the great meeting house of the Quakers near the market. I sat down among them, and after looking round a while and hearing nothing, being very drowsy through labor and want of rest the preceding night, I fell asleep and continued so until the meeting broke up, when one was so kind enough to rouse me. This was, therefore, the first house I was in, or slept in, in Philadelphia. Walking down again toward the river, and looking at the faces of the people I met, I had met a young Quaker man whose countenance I liked, and costing him, requested he would tell me where a stranger could get lodging. We were near the, the sign of the three mariners. He, here, says he, is one place that entertains strangers, but it's not a reputable house. If thee wilt walk with me, I'll show thee a better. He brought me to the crooked billet in Water Street. Here I got dinner, and while I was eating it, several sly questions were asked to me. It seemed to me, he suspected from my youth and appearance, that I might be some sort of runaway. After dinner, my sleepiness returned, and being shown to bed, I laid down without undressing, and slept till six in the evening, was called to supper, went to bed again very early, and slept soundly till the morning. Then I made myself as tidy as I could, and went to Andrew Branford's printers. I found in the shop the old man, his father, whom I had sent, seen at New York, and who, traveling on horseback, had gone to Philadelphia before me. He introduced me to his son, received me civilly, gave me breakfast, but told me he did not present want of a hand, being lately supplied with one. But there was another printer in town, lately set up, one creamer, who perhaps might employ me. If not, I should be welcome to lodge at his house, and he would give me a little work to do now and then till fuller business should be offered. The old gentleman said he would go with me to New Printer, and when we found him, neighbor, says Bradford, I have brought to see you a young man of your business. Perhaps you may want such one. And he asked me a few questions, putting a composing stick in my hand to see how I worked, and then he would employ me soon though he had just then nothing for me to do, and taking old Bradford, whom he never had seen before, to one of the townspeople that had good will for him, entered into conversation on his present undertaking and prospects, while Bradford, not discovering that he was was the other printer's father, one creamer said that he expected soon to get the greatest part of the business into his own hands, drew on by artful question, and starting little doubts to explain all his views, what interests he relied on, and in what manner he intended to proceed. I, who stood by and heard all, saw immediately that one of them was a crafty old fister, and the other merely a novice. Bradford led me, left me with Creamer, who was greatly surprised when I told him who the old man was. Creamer's printing house, I found, consisted of an old shattered press, one small worn-out font of English, which he was then using himself, composed an elegy of an Aquila Rose before mentioning, an ingenious young man of excellent character, much of respect for the town, clerk of the assembly, and a pretty poet. Creer made verses too, but very indifferently. He could not be said to write them, for his manner was to compose them in the types directly out of his head. So there being no copy but one pair of cases, and the elegy likely to require all the letters, no one could help him. I endeavored to put his press, which he had not yet used, and of which he understood nothing, into order fit to be worked with, and promising to come off and print off his elegy as soon as he should have got it ready. I returned to Bradford, who gave me a little job to do for the present, and there I lodged and dieted. After a few days, Creamer sent for me to print off the elegy, and now he had got another pair of cases, and a pamphlet to reprint, on which he sent me to work. These two printers, I found, poorly qualified for their business. Bradford had not been bred to it, and was very illiterate, and Creamer, though something of a scholar, was a mere compositor, knowing nothing of press work. He had been one of the French prophets that could act to their enthusiastic allegations. At this time, he did not profess any particular religion, but something of the occasion, 
was very ignorant of the world and had, I afterward found, a good deal of knave in his composition. He did not like my lodging with Bradford while I was working with him. He had a house, indeed, without furniture, so he could not lodge me. But he got me a lodging at Mr. Reed's before mentioned, who was the owner of the house, and my chest and clothes being coming at the time, I r made rather a more respectful appearance in the eyes of Miss Reed than I had done when she first happened to see me eating a roll in the street. I began now to have some acquaintances among the young people of town that were lovers of reading, which whom I spent my evenings very pleasantly, and gaining money by my industry and frugality, I lived very agreeably, forgetting Boston as much as I could, and not desiring that any there should know where I resided except my friend Collins, who was in my secret, and kept it when I wrote to him. At length, an instant appeared that had sent me back again much sooner than I had intended. I had a brother-in-law, Robert Holmes, master of the sloop that trade between Boston and Delaware. He, being a, at Newcastle, 40 miles below Philadelphia, heard of me and wrote a letter mentioning the concerns of my friends in Boston and abrupt departure, assuring me of their goodwill to me, that everything would be accommodated to my mind if I returned, to which he exhorted me very earnestly. I wrote an answer to this letter, thanking him for his advice, but stated my reasons for quitting Boston, and in such light as to convince him I was not so wrong as he had apprehended. And that, my friends, will have to do it for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you're watching this on Facebook, please follow our Facebook page. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like it and follow our YouTube page. Thank you so much for listening to this adult story time, word of mouth. The book I have read it was, again, the autobiography of Ben Franklin, the first four chapters or so. Uh, sorry, three chapters and a little bit of the introduction. And you can find this actually in her library on Hoopla and Cloud Library. You can also get this book through interlibrary loans from our reference department, which is upstairs in the second floor of the main library. Thank you and have a wonderful day.